the living conversation is both between us and within us. And the between us is the bigger and bigger us. So there are so many levels of conversation. We want to make room, you know, for those levels and for that conversation <clears throat> to be alive in us. That as, as Anna sort of reminded us, the, the living conversation is an, an, an organism of meaning that we are that is within us that we are within. Then if there's any gesture or movement of release and getting here uh, that, that is right for you, I'm being influenced by the whole body focusing people. Ah, we can bring ourselves into our present moment here together. There's a big job for us tonight. The third of the, of the workshops about um, caring for the conversation and when conversation goes astray. And uh, several of you have asked questions like um, Rachel asked, well, you know, what if the conversation isn't safe? What do you, do you withdraw? Do you, what do you do? And many conversations about uh, the moments of difficulty. And so we, we might call this, this evening riding the waves of conversation. But what can we say about that huge subject, you know, in the two hours that we have together? It's very, very big. And it's very, very, very important and I'm hoping that this workshop series will just be a little taste. Some of you will go further by taking the community empowerment training starting next Wednesday. Others of you will take it further in many other ways. But I'm just gonna start by saying a couple of things before we even get a chance to say what's there for us. Uh, from last time. I, I don't know if I agonized, I was going to say I agonized about how to condense so much into our two hours, but I wouldn't say I agonized. I puzzled because it was, it was enjoyable to think about it. Uh, when I would wake up in the middle of the night, that's what I would think about. What would, what would be the most you know, get us into it the most. So one of the concepts that I think is, is most important and uh, a, a handle for us uh, comes from nonlinear dynamic systems theory. And uh, that philosophy, uh, a contemporary philosophy of uh, I would call post postmodernism that um, that parallels Jean's philosophy in many ways. Talks about systems of all kinds, all kinds of living systems, including stars and microorganisms, and you know all kinds of things. And one of the the main concepts is what they call the the tipping point, and that's the the point that uh, living organisms need to hover around between something that is too rigid and something that's too chaotic. So if you picture a, you know, a galaxy or something, or a, uh, you know, whether it's going to be able to uh, be self-generating will depend a great deal on whether it can find that balance. And um, friendship, our relationships with ourselves, uh, focusing partnerships, uh, therapy relationships, and conversation and community, um, community wellness all depend on finding that balance between um, 
between too much um, repetition, stuckness, deadness, expected behavior, and and uh, and uh, too much um, chaotic unpredictability, flying off the handle, uh, too much going on to process, things going faster than we can, can manage, getting triggered. So if you picture these things, the, the living conversation, caring for the living conversation entails finding that, uh, that place that has the spontaneity and the improvisation, the risk-taking, and at the same time has the continuity, the feeling of the, the, the trust that something will continue and be held, um, the structure of what keeps us um, together, feeling like a we. Um, Shaka Faye pointed out in our last group that uh, Jean's philosophy is very much a structure that keeps us within that realm of feeling um, safe, but not too safe, feeling the freedom to play and um, not going off the rails, going to the edge, but not going over the edge. And I think that that concept is, is a wonderful concept for us to keep in mind because we can almost picture it. When things go wrong, how are they going wrong? Are they, are they uh, too rigid or are they too chaotic? And, and if we see ourselves as not just caring for ourselves, which is of course absolutely essential and not just caring for the other that we love in the group, but caring for the conversation itself, then we're wanting to be able to be empowered to move the conversation either in the direction of a little more uh, saying, a little more risk-taking, a little more um, uh, calling it as it as we feel it is and taking, you know, saying it as a, in a personal way, or, uh, or we want to be able to call it back to structure and say, let's take a breath here. And anybody can do that in the conversation. You can even do that in a political conversation. You know, people might look at you a little funny, but you could still do it. You could say, Oh, I need a breath here. Anybody else need a breath? Let's just take a minute to see what we're saying. You see, if you don't say it in that formal kind of way, but you, you say it from yourself, oh, I need a minute. Let's see what's going on here. It can, be, it can bring us back to the place where there's enough structure, enough safety. So I just wanna say that. And I want to leave a pause for us to take it in. And then I want to bring us back to where we are here in the conversation, which isn't just tonight. Now it's our third week and it's our conversation has become thick and meaningful with a great deal of complexity from the input of all of us, even those who haven't spoken in the large group, but we feel you. The conversation that has developed over, over these three weeks, we wanna come, come right here now to this tip of where we are in this adventure of finding the life in the conversation and caring for it, tending it like a garden. 
seeing where it needs water, where it needs sunshine, being willing sometimes to get up before dawn to stake it down if a storm is coming. I want to ask you, before we go further, what you remember, what struck you from last time. And I want to share a little bit of, of what struck me from last time, but I'd like you to go first. So anybody, just what you remember. It doesn't have to be the most important thing. Uh, in, in my class in China, I just loved my teaching in China. Um, and uh, I... It was all in translation. I asked the students, you know, what they remembered from the day before, and uh, and one of the, one of the students made her way to the microphone, and it was so important for her to speak. And she said, "I remember your earrings. I never saw earrings like that before," and it was such a wonderful moment. It was so alive. It was so real, and it was something that uh, was un unsayable, not because it was too much to say, but just because nobody would say that. And she said that and there was a big relief or release or people laughing and smiling at each other about my earrings. But I don't remember which earrings they were, but so uh, anything that you have to say that you remember is welcome. I remember that Geneva said, Ginevra said that when she's not met, she watches TV. Ah, uh, yes, I remember that moment too. And, and the comments about how deeply important it is for us to be met, that deep longing to be met and what happens when we aren't met. And I remember someone else saying, I think it was Olivia, about how she commits to meeting herself. And that was very intriguing, how she does that, to meet, meet herself when she isn't met. Anybody else? Thanks for starting us out, Jim. You know, one thing that I remember is um, that someone pointed out the gigantic uh, step it is to go from a focusing situation where we're taking turns, even in a group, we're taking turns, uh, or in my day, a consciousness raising group where we took turns and a conversation where we're speaking spontaneously. And then you have to think, when do I speak? Am I speaking too much? I'm thinking to myself, am I speaking too much? Here, Lynn, shut up a minute. Um, uh, do I speak before or after? Is this point now past? Can I go back to all of those complex decisions about being part of a web, being part of a, a system? So thank you for starting. And I, I want to say that um, what I remember from last week was the internal agitation and um, reverberation of my body as I was sitting here and I was both holding this space um, that's very white and holding what was transpiring with the Haitian community mm. and um, and then having had a call with a friend and holding that too and 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 sort of like this triangle that it's really every point is touching but mm -hmm. every point or every side of that triangle can also stand alone and 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 without the need of the support of the other but then that's not a triangle then that's a something else that's just three stick in the middle of nowhere without and so what I remember in that day um, last week, it's it's the this sort of like not having been met, but also not having been asked to be met. Mm. So there was that part of myself that felt like I'm not being met here. What's going on here, right? Mm. 
but it's also after that, that part that recognize and touch that I also didn't ask to be met. Mm -hmm. I also didn't uh, bring that into mm -hmm. the space and, and noticing how, how there are times when I can get into the space of blaming the other when I too bear responsibility for how the conversation evolves and unfolds. Mm. Um, and so that, that really carried me forward this next week after last week, Wednesday. And mm. I was able to take those bits and pieces and um, integrate them to other places where I was kind of like, oh, I'm not being met, no one it's, And then take a breath and really be honest with myself and mm -hmm. ask how I'm not giving even people the opportunity to meet me and mm -hmm. hold me. Mm -hmm. And so that that's kind of like my piece from last week. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. And we might put that in the framework of the tipping point that, uh, that the not saying um, not asking, not saying is the, the being too safe. Uh, that maybe that would bring it more in to say, you know, nobody's talking about the elephant in the room with this, with the Haitian, with something. I need to acknowledge that or whatever it is that you would say that would bring you in would be that little risk. We're going to talk more about that later on in the evening. Um, I kind of don't remember what was discussed in this group. And I had some conversations out of the group with people in the group. But um, what's been hitting me is this, this general way of being received and how a lot of the Zoom groups that I'm in, mm. um, nobody receives you. <laughs> Like, like that, that's in contrast to this group, um, but uh, how, how unsafe I, and, and um, uncomfortable it can feel just to say something and then it just seems to go off into the, you know, the tether or whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. How important it is to be received and then what happens when you, there's this vacancy or, uh, or it goes off in another direction. Uh, that's one of our big challenges, right? Uh, how we care for ourselves as well as caring for the conversation. I, uh, uh, one of the things that I remember is uh, Paula saying that in her small group, she felt like the magic didn't happen and she was disappointed. And then she realized that, well, you can't just have certain techniques and then the magic will, will happen. But there was something about her acknowledging that the magic didn't happen that felt like uh, several people felt very enlivened by that. And I was, I was thinking about uh, part of the magic is the magic of being able to talk about the conversation, being uh, able to um, say, I won't say say the unsayable because that may be going too far. Saying the, the, the outside the box, because we have all these boxes of conversation, but to say, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't feel the magic and I want it, or to say, I don't feel like I'm being received or for uh, Isabel to say, you know, there's something going on here and I'm, I'm not being met here. There's something very enlivening and bringing, bringing, the, bringing the tipping point to the center of 
acknowledging something that's unnoticed and the intimacy of talking about the conversation itself. And Lynn, I see that Monica's had her hand up. Oh, please. Thank yes. you for, uh, I'm not going to see you. I, those okay. of you who don't know, I have poor vision, just speak. But I love that, that uh, you're speaking for each other to say, I want to hear from so-and-so. She has her hand up. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I, I just want to take in first what Laura says. Hi, Laura. Uh, about how difficult uh, it's been for me to be in these Zoom groups. Because whenever, whenever I share something, it just goes out on, on the void. You know, it seems that the next person that is going to share it doesn't even listen in to what I'm saying. Mm. So I, I, I thank you for, thank you for encouraging me to, to participate. And the second thing that encouraged me to participate today was the earring part, where sometimes I feel like I don't wanna participate because I don't wanna lose uh, people times that I'm not gonna do, say something smart enough or, 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 or interesting enough or has to do with the class before. So, so sometimes I feel like I don't wanna participate because I'm, I'm not smart enough. I don't have anything like really has to do with the class. Mm -hmm. And my participation today is about, I, I fell asleep last class. Mm. So I went away. <laughs> <laughs> I was completely exhausted. <laughs> so I was so sorry. I was making a lot of effort to keep on on being not awake because it was on it, there's only three classes and I was like, oh my God, I have to be awake for the <laughs> Leeds class. But I couldn't. And the third thing I want to share is that, well, I'm from Mexico and and also part of my personality is that I'm very spontaneous. And I have a, I love my sense of humor. And what <laughs> I have found, I, I, what I have found not only in this class or in other focusing communities is that sometimes I go like, ah, hugging people and, and people is like, this crazy woman. And so sometimes I feel like my spontaneity has to be shut off because I, I feel like, like I'm too much, you know? So that's what I wanted to share. <laughs> wow, uh, wonderful riches there. And I'd like to uh, say to Monica, that I really received what you just said. And especially um, uh, the fact that sometimes we don't speak because we don't think we're smart enough or we're going to add something of value and, and that kind of silences us. And sometimes just because our personalities are uh, more exuberant than, um, uh, the classical uh, Western personality that uh, we we hesitate to speak so that people don't think we're crazy. <laughs> and and I really uh, I really uh, took that in. Monica, I love you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, Monica, that you gave us a new term, the earring principle. Uh, we're always afraid of, of uh, uh, being too much, being too little, um, not being relevant enough, being, you know, too big, too small, talking too much, to, you know, there's that, that um, feeling that we have of, of whatever it is, it's not going to be right. We're, 
we're too spontaneous. We're not, I always had the, the, uh, the other side, Monica, a feeling like I'm not exuberant enough. I'm like this wasp and I just say things, you know, blah. And I wanted to be able to be more emotional. Uh, but I, it reminds me, um, I, I hope the men forgive me for this sexist remark, but it reminds me of breast sizes. Women never feel, we women often, never feel that our breasts are the right size. They're either too big, they're too little, they're this, they're that. And that's sort of the same way in a conversation. We're not feel like whatever way we are isn't gonna be the right way. So you, you took a big risk in saying what you said to, to give us that, uh, that uh, directionality between safe and not too safe. Um, you know, I, I did listen to the, to the YouTube um, you know, recording at like probably 80%. And then I think, you know, I was uh, maybe uh, uh, just uh, reminded of the tone of the, of the conversation, you know, reassuring, comforting, openness, receptivity, uh, a lot of it in, in a lot of uh, people willingness to uh, to receive, I think. And, and then I, I'm a little thinking of, I'm thinking about what Laura said and Monica and the, this um, uh, sometimes in other Zoom groups, there isn't a, uh, uh, you know, nobody, nobody is being received or in ways that perhaps here that if we risk uh, in this group, we can be received. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what it comes to mind. Um, so <laughs> just that's, yeah, that's what I was, my comment, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot in that. Uh, here, maybe we can risk to be received. There can be something that develops in the cult, in in the culture of a living conversation, some sort of intentionality around that. And one important dimension of that is the commitment to receive mm. the other. Mm. And, you know, it's pos I have varying kinds of experiences of kind of being in, in certain kinds of discussion groups and um, they're, they're very, they're very topic oriented, and I'm not against topics, but but um, but they're but some of the the person who's interacting with the topic doesn't get um, doesn't get related to, and uh, um, yeah, it's a way. Yeah, and that's a that's a missing piece for me around that kind of um, the kind of aliveness that can come through um, uh, going downstairs and or connecting with uh, you know the person behind the words mm -hmm. in some kind of way and they can change the words and the concepts can change too but it's that commitment to the receptivity mm -hmm. it slows things down too mm -hmm. And it's less clever. That's my beef. <laughs> what, what do you mean it's less clever? Well, sometimes you can just, you know, certain kinds of conversations, you know, sort of picking up on that, you know, certain kinds of conversations can be, um, you're back and forthing around, you know, ideas and, that kind of thing, and and you can get we can get caught in sort of um, playing or playing with or shaping the ideas, and and uh, being funny about it and that kind of thing. And again, it's nice to laugh and all of that kind of stuff. But there's but there's a an orientation towards um, you know sort of pick up on what. Monica was, you know, and everybody probably has had some version of experience, but there's this orientation towards being smart. And um, that can miss something. Mm. So. There's a, 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 what comes to me is a kind of competitive 
ness in the play and that play can be so much more um, um, creative without the element of uh, being smarter than or, or, or being better than in some way somebody else in, in the group, that kind of game, the competitive games uh, versus the creative games. Yeah. Yeah, that word helps me understand, you know, think about that, that, that particular C, the competitive thing in some kind of way, you know, um, yeah. And there's a difference, I'll just say really quickly, there's a difference between, you know, um, when, when you say something like, oh, I, I love that idea. There's a difference between saying that and saying, well, that's an excellent idea. And there's, there, there, there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. Different kind of aliveness. Mm -hmm. Different felt sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll park here. I, I wanted to also catch that about how we're creating a culture. Uh, a culture is, is so important in terms of um, a living conversation because it's, it's that nebulous usness that may not be uh, deliberate intentional rules of conversation, but it's, it's the felt sense of how we are together that we're developing and that it that expands and grows and we feel held by a culture and by the multiculturalness of all of us in many 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 ways you know of all of our cultures coming together but forming an a particular us culture of this group and how we are together There's something of the spontaneity that seems really important that that word from from Monica and then I think from Steve and just something about the spontaneity and the kind of like a bit of the dipping in and then coming back up but being able to sort of talk about the interaction and also the content or the subject matter like to, to have both seems to bring an aliveness and um, it's, it's like how conversation isn't a spectator sport or you don't want it to be a rerun. I, I You can kind of felt, I, I at least can feel held captive if somebody wants to tell me a narrative that I, you can tell they've told it a thousand times and there's a certain reaction they want. And it's they're not telling you for any particular reason other than that it's dinner conversation or it's supposed to be an amusing story. And you're like forced into being an audience, but there's not an alive interaction. They're not telling you because they need anything or asking anything of you in particular. There's, you're sort of unnecessary. You, you sort of have audience with the Pope, but no blessing. You just are like forced into audienceness for something you didn't buy a ticket to. So that is unpleasant. I just don't know what that has to do with anything. But the aliveness, it's like there's, a, there's an attunement to the interaction or an interest and curiosity in not just the content of what's coming from the other, but like the relating between you, sort of what's emerging or what's evolving and the exchange of information. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have like the skill set whatsoever, but it seems like there are ways to, to kind of, you know, in, in focusing how we'll say, well, how is that for you? Or is this right? Or have I got this? Um, I used to have a non-focusing friend who would say to me, how would you like me to listen? Or, or what kind of feedback would you like? Or is it okay if I just blurb? Like, can you receive that for me? Can I just like kind of get this out? And it was so courte courteous. It was like knocking on the door before just plunging into the room like Kramer or something, you know, in Seinfeld. It, it, was, it was so like, is this okay? And it just... 
I don't know, there was like a, um, a language that was created, like a, um, like a doorway or something that, that isn't always, always there. So, and, and then I guess the question I have, that's what I wanted to share. And the question is, it's in the spontaneity or in the, the, the sort of risking, speaking about what is there, I find it quite tricky to find the right distance or, or the, how, how to sort of not be too close and, and not be too obtuse, but, but sort of what is okay to speak about and, and what is okay to say, you seem a set or I notice your nose is crinkled or something, but not to say, I, I don't know, something that would be aggressive or, or hit the wrong note and, and really close the person off or offend them or be in a, an unintended or intended aggression. So it, it's, it's quite tricky to, to, for me, I don't have a knowing about this is bringing it into the present, but not too much so that the person is like not safe or I'm not safe. So we're, we're talking here about it's not a, sp a, a spectator sport. But then I had the image of this ball game, you know, and you don't want to hit the person in the head with the ball. You want to throw it in a way that the, somebody else will catch it. Um, you don't want it to go out of bounds, um, but but there's a lot to it, isn't there? It's it's a very complex game because there are many many balls in the air and many different levels, uh, and we're doing it with our felt sense. We're not just doing it consciously. We're doing it in so many ways. Is it too close? Is it too distant? Is it will it get the ball in the basket? If that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. What you said reminded me also, Rachel, of somebody uh, talking um, last time. Um, wait a minute, I lost my thought there. It went right out of my head. Wow. That happens to you. <laughs> <laughs> And find it later. Yes. Uh, mm. the, I woke you all up at three o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> that was the thing I that went right out of my head. I don't know if this will bring it back on track, but there's something that comes from you, just this image of sort of volleying, like to, to toss the ball so that the other person is likely to to catch it or, or has the opportunity to step back if they just had their nails done or something and can't catch the ball. But so it's not a violent like spiking onto them and it's, yeah. So, so there's something about like a gentle, like with a balloon where you just kind of hit it lightly to the other. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just wanted to, say something in response to what Rachel said, if that's okay. I just was so touched by the, your story about your friend who was so um, respectful about um, before starting the conversation, uh, asking about what kind of, you know, feedback you wanted or, or the time or, or the, the kind of listening. And, um, it just reminded me of something I, I heard somewhere once that that has really stayed with me. Um, I wish I could remember the, the writer or where I saw this, but it was something about, you know, to never assume that just because somebody is being silent, that we're not interrupting. Mm. When we say something to them, I mean, they might be in the middle of a really major thought or, you know, so that that sense of, um, I don't think it was in a focusing context, but it might've been, but that just that sense of, of really asking permission, you know, like, is this a good time 
for us to have a conversation just because you're sitting there, quote unquote, not doing anything. I, I have no idea what may be going on inside. Checking, it's so important in focusing. Let's hear one more comment and then I'm going to. Kati's had her hand up for a while. Oh, thank you. I love this new culture where we're all calling on people that have their hands up. Hi. Um, you know, I was, I'm listening to this conversation and I'm resonating from last week. And I remember how difficult the exercise was um, mm -hmm. because everything that kept coming up were about, you know, you ask for a positive conversation. I kept thinking of negative conversations, a living conversation. I kept thinking about conversations that aren't happening, dialogues that aren't happening, you know, the, the volleying, the spiking even that isn't happening. Um, and that kept happening a lot last week. Um, and I, you know, this, this bit about culture, um, I, I'm still resonating with Isabel's comment earlier about Haitian immigrants. Um, and I think that sometimes it's hard to have conversations um, about culture when, um, when there isn't common language and sometimes all the, the common thing that then connects, and this is what, what I feel and sometimes I sense is, is the silence that sometimes follows. And that's something that's unifying. Um, and, and for me, I think part of what I like about Jen Lin's work, it's there is something unifying about that felt sense that each one of us, every living being carries regardless of where we're from. Um, and not everyone focuses, but it is something that I try to remember because it is a very, um, the silence can sometimes get very loud and it can go on for too long at times when there isn't um, a listening ear on the other end. Absolutely. And then it's so, uh, tender that place where we want to leave a pause for people to take in what you said and and then the pause can feel like a silence it can sort of be like that uh leaping and catching that rachel talked about last week of uh in the tango like we let a pause but then we'll will we will we be able to catch that Let's just let the pause be, but anyone who has something to say here now in response to catch that ball is welcome. Uh, to me, what comes for me is um, it's kind of like um, listening to the silence or trying to listen like what kind of silence is this silence? You know, there's so many, I don't know what Katie said, so many, there, 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 there are so many different silences. It's like one silence is, um, you can't even listen to it because it doesn't have words, but somehow you can feel it, right? You can feel what kind of silence is this. Is it a pause or is it a silence of, of disconnection or is it a silence of not understanding or if, is it a silence of anger? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I also, I also know that some people cannot bear any silence at all. They just get really nervous. And they want to fill it up with sound and, and words and um, 
and people have their own their own their own way in it how they uh, how they deal with silence and, and I'm taken back to spaces that I've been in where I've said things and I could hear the crickets in the room chirping mm -hmm. and the uncomfortability of it. Um, and I am imagining and I'm empathizing of how many times maybe I have done that to other people and how... Um, how that was never acknowledged because maybe I didn't know that it was happening or that I was doing it. And so within myself right now, there is this changing that's occurring of, okay, so what do you do next time when I'm in that space and I drop the ball or I don't know how to pick up the conversation on what someone has said. Um, and so there is something occurring within me of like, well, how do you carry forward this experience that I'm having internally and share and empathize with someone who have experienced the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and an awareness that is occurring to me of, yeah, you know, chances are um, this, this has probably happened elsewhere where mm -hmm. I've been a part of that too. Mm -hmm. the, the feeling that maybe in the silence when you take a risk, uh, that it could be that people don't know how to pick up the ball. Right. Uh, I can imagine there are different difficult communities that I wouldn't know how to relate to. And I'm wondering, I'm asking myself, what would it be like for me to say out loud, you know what, I heard what you said, but I can't really relate because I'm not from that place that you're from. You know, and, and that's that's something I'm asking myself, like, what would be the language? What words would I use to let that person know that, you know, I, I get it, but I don't know what to say in response. And maybe even saying that out loud might be good enough. Mm. Mm. I mean, I, I, I think um, that, uh, I mean, to respond, I mean, I think that what I said before that, it seems that in this place, if we were to say openly, you know, listen, I'm hurting because what's happening in Haiti, then perhaps there will be a response that will be met. So I think, it, I don't know, I mean, perhaps it needed to be articulated very taking the risk and saying something, you know what I mean? Like, because I don't know, what I'm hearing is that somehow we should have pick up that people were hurting about what's going on, but nobody's saying I'm hurting what's happening, you know, and, and with the Haitian population in Mexico, you know, and so they have a lot of pain. And then maybe from that place, then we can be met, can met you, met the, the people who are, you know, hurting. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I, that's what I'm, I mean, what I'm saying, I think the, the space is here that if we're having something that something is going on with us that we can risk and say it, and I think there'll be a response. Um, mm. Is it all right if I respond to that, Roberta? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Sure. I, I, I go back to Lynn's comment about breast sizes. And even as I hear you say that comment, something occurs to me and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, there, you know, there, there's never enough to say about something that sure there are Haitians in Mexico and under bridges, but I'm, I'm like, well, what about the Afghans just a few weeks ago, right? Or what about the Uyghurs in China? Like there's always suffering and there's always harm that's inflicted on someone somewhere. And, um, you know, it's really difficult to hold space for the heaviness of that, that comes with, from my perspective, there's a heaviness that comes with poverty. And, and that's not something that is easy to, um, to hold space for. Mm -hmm. Because there is such great, deep, um, 
it's like going into the abyss of these conversations about suffering and, and who suffers and, and what do you do about it because the issues are so global, are so deeply entrenched, and there is a deep sense of helplessness that goes along with it. Yeah. I just want to say I'm off camera, but I'm alive and well here. Uh, just taking all this in and I just put something in the chat, uh, but it, it's a TED talk and, and the name of it is why I have coffee with people who send me hate mail. And I think that that speaks directly to what um, Katie, you, Katie, you would speak into it's how do I engage in conversation that are difficult for me um, from a place of kindness and compassion and I don't know how to do that all the time right <laughs> I don't know and so this is an experiment that I'm conducting with myself just to check in when I didn't do that like even now I pull back because I was like excuse me this is recorded but i was like fuck isabel why you have to bring that up shut up and sit down right um and yeah i have to check that and i brought it up because it's a lie for me um i i have friends from haiti i have friends uh from the middle east and 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 it's alive and and how can i sit here in this group and not share some of what is alive for me. That would seem hypocritical, right? And not looking for anything to be done about it, but sort of like presencing myself. So just wanted to say that. So I'm still here. I'm just off camera because I'm like super, I'm beginning to go down in my tiredness level. So I'm like, Ugh. so, but still here, present and well. I think that what you said, Isabel, and, and we're learning, one of the things that we're trying to learn is to listen not only to the individual and to the subject, you know, the content, but to listen to uh, the flow of the conversation, how the us is moving. And, uh, and we're moving in this direction of making it safe to talk about um, the the difficult things to talk about talking about saying something that um where you're feeling on the edge or you're feeling um that you can be marginalized or you're feeling like people won't understand and um and finding the the courage to say something but then katie i i thought that there was a real um, forward movement in your saying uh, all of us drop the ball or um, don't don't know how to to catch it uh, at times and just saying I don't know how to respond but I'm with you your intention is is the way of catching the ball and I thought that was that was a, a wonderful way of talking about um, the power of, of talking about the conversation. It's not just what the person is, the content, but saying, I don't know what to say right now, but I'm, I'm here with you, which is what you're doing, Isabel. You're saying, I'm here, um, but I'm off camera. So I think this is a moment when um, we're going to have we're a little over time here. I'm going to give you a, a little attunement. And uh, then we're going to have a, a 10 minute break and, um, and go into our breakout rooms of three, shall we? Of three. And just talk about what came up in this conversation so far and in the attunement. Uh, in that group of three and uh, and see what happens if you don't take turns. But if you want to take turns, it's okay. That's like the, the bike with training wheels is to take turns. Sometimes that's, that's good to be able to go back to. 
So are, are you ready to have a, a brief um, a brief attunement? And then we're gonna just sit with that attunement while you take your little break. Maybe we can just take a six minute break or something and then go into our breakout rooms and share. Does that seem right? Okay, let's take a breath and settle in our seats and just give all this that has come and evolved a chance to settle like a big meal. So much complexity, so many levels. So many worlds that come together here in this world. And coming back to, to that idea of the tipping point and, and what Katie said about how uh, all of us have dropped the ball or don't know how to pick up the ball or catch the ball at times. And on the other side, all of us have been the one to, to throw the ball too hard and it hits the other person in the, in the guts or something. Or there's the chaos of too many balls being thrown at the same time and then feeling like you're, you're dodging balls rather than playing. We're just gonna feel that image of that place where we can go this way or this way. And the invitation, the, the, the simplest thing is to say something about the experience. I mean, there's so many billions of things that we need to think about the skills and what to do, but now just can we say something from our own experience that will bring the conversation back to the balance? Or maybe it won't, but we're doing that. We're saying something. We're just going to imagine that quote that I love that the greatest power is to be able to change the conversation. Whoa, that really sends shivers through my system that we can change the conversation. And often just by saying what's going on in us in a personal, non-judgmental way, non-blaming way. I'm just gonna give you a minute. Just visit that place of bringing the conversation back by saying something. So let's, whatever is there for anybody is welcome. We're continuing the conversation. I wanna say that um, the team and I went over the handout that I sent you and um, uh, Yoka and Clara helped uh, uh, revise it. So it's in a better form. And we thought about, you know, talking about these points of what deadens the conversation, what can enliven the conversation. But there's so much there. Um, and we don't want you to be looking at points, but sort of seeing the points in you. So uh, if you have those handouts and you wanna refer to something in them, that's very, very welcome. 
But anything that's there from your, your breakout rooms, from our discussion earlier is, is welcome. It's also very welcome as we've been sort of developing our culture together to say, oh, I wanna hear from so-and-so. Do you have something to say? Or I'm curious about what so-and-so has to say. That's also welcome. There was something that was there for me in the, at that, towards the close of the, the first part of our, our session. Um, I wrote some notes that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. Um, I'm appreciating uh, that, that distinction that you brought, Lynn, around the kind of tending to the whole conversation, like tending to the conversation as another entity that's present. And uh, in, our, in our breakout room, Elizabeth prompted me, it's like, well, there's also the, the culture that we're in that can be tended, like that's the even larger context. I'm like, whoa. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one, one distinction I learned from another kind of uh, work that's like called uh, the circling is kind of like, there's a way that we can contact, I guess I'm using like a Comey concept, like contact if anyone's familiar uh, or like kind of a name or kind of be with that larger thing and name the thing that's kind of, that I, I might see that's present that may be also present for others. Like at the, towards the end of the conversation, I was hearing lots of people uh, pointing at, at a wrestling in themselves of like, what do I say here? Like, this is a, such a hard place for me, whether let's say I don't know what to say because I don't know how to relate, or there is something in me that just feels so strongly that I, I don't know how to bring that without like crushing the other person. Or like, if there's just a silence, like, what do I do? And there's this kind of wrestling that um, we were, many people were talking about. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess like one of the things of like, maybe that's like naming the larger things and kind of uh, seeing if I can almost demonstrate what I'm pointing at. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, in, in the kind of wrestling, there's this interesting distinction or separation that sometimes I notice in like a lot of in conversations with the people that I've talked about kind of like, there's the part in me that's like, what do I say? And it's almost like the, what do I say part is trying to generate some output of, oh, the thing I say is X, Y, Z. And somehow there's a separation between the wrestling and the thing that I say. And um, in circling world, something that's been super helpful and felt so rich to me and a freedom that came is that they're like, oh, you can just say the thing that is the happening, like focusing style. Like, oh, there's something in me that's like wrestling with what to say right now. And I think that's exactly what uh, I'm looking around. Kate, Katie, that's exactly what you're like. I, I, don't, uh, I don't know what to say, don't relate. Uh, and mm -hmm. that brings, that is the in-between conversation. That's not just uh, uh, talking about something. It's the thing that's happening right here. What Jean calls talking from your experience rather than about something. Since this is our uh, last meeting, um, I want to try not being the one, this is, this is sort of like a, a step forward, not being the one to reflect and to hold all of the strands together just for 10 minutes. We're gonna try um, all of us doing that. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, deputizing all of you to have my job as the host. So all of you are going to be in charge of, you know, reflecting, putting the strands together, inviting people. And let's just see how that is. And that's a big risk to me because I always, I'm, a, I, I'm afraid that uh, if I don't hold the strands, you know, that they'll, that they'll get like in crochet, you know, that they'll get lost or something. So I'm gonna take a risk in the next uh, seven minutes. 
um, during this conversation to just see what happens if all of you do my job. So Lynn, what you're saying is <laughs> you're wanting to experiment with not being the person who, who um, uh, responds and receives and, and makes sure that threads um, don't drop. And, and, and there's, it's a risk, it feels like a risk. Mm -hmm. that yes. Yeah. Yes. I feel very met. And I, I'm, I'm just experimenting with trying to take a screen full of people in rather than zeroing in on my own little box. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I, I kind of had to laugh a little bit that, that Lynn said that for seven whole minutes. <laughs> <laughs> For the Twitter's experiments. <laughs> <laughs> Courageous. <laughs> yeah, so and um and then yeah, Laura who's kind of jumping right in. And um so and I feel like, oh yeah, well, apart from that laughing about it, there's something in me feels like, oh, oh, that's something of a responsibility here you know it feels different Lynn, when you say that and, and like that we all all together you know uh, have that have that task or something and, uh, so uh, i don't know what to do with it except for just i'm, I'm just gonna ask somebody to to say something so, um, um, and I don't know who, because I want to ask so many people, but um, maybe I'll ask um, Anna. Anna, what's, is there something you would like to say or something from this evening, what we have done so far? I would like to, to hear what Rachel is, is, is keeping there. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, was, it was there, so. Just, yeah, just back to Lara's response to Lynn and then Yoko coming in also, it, it feels like gathering around a Christmas tree or something, or it just feels like holding up one another. But it, there's this sensation of, um, or an experience I'm having of uh, like uh, delight, uh, something close to delight and, and love, like seeing people who I love, who I know all here together and having Lynn risk and Laura save the day and be right there with like, it's just, it's, it's sort of like watching people you like meet and I don't know, it's something like seeing your children playing with other children, not, but, or like your, I don't know, it's something where I feel a sort of pride and Oh, pride and joy. I've never said those together, but my mom used to say that all the time. But some kind of pride and joy in, in experiencing and witnessing the, the interaction, the, the willingness to meet each other. So that was a ton of words. Maybe, Anna, you want to take back when you hear what I have to say. But it's it's like a pleasure. And that feels like a living conversation and, and kind of great fun to, to be with. Rachel, you bring me a lot of joy, like all the idea of the Christmas tree and all together playing and everything. And what I, the word that I'm taking the most from these uh, three times together is risk. Mm. We children take risk. They don't even, they don't even think if they're gonna cut themselves or kill themselves mm -hmm. or whatever, you know? And, and you know, I, well, I, I, I don't know if, well, I wanna share with you my, my father died six months ago and, and life has been a little bit hectic, Rachel knows lately with my family and, and everything. And there is something I want to take out from all this. 
like every day is precious and I'm willing to take the risk. Mm. And I don't care if the other person like my taking my risk or not, mm. but I think I wanna cry when I wanna cry. I wanna gel when I wanna gel. I wanna be upset when I wanna be upset. And I really wanna take the risk. And maybe if I take the risk, people will start taking the risk also and being available and honest and different. Mm. And, and I was sharing with Marta that I spent three months in New York and I felt like, like, uh, like people, like, well, I can, I can say everyone, but I walking in the streets, I was, I was feeling like, like really lonely. No one see you in the eyes. No one say hello. No one, no mm. one even cares about you. So the homeless were my best friends. Mm. I get to sit down by them and say, hi, how are you? How, how's your day? I don't even, even give them money, but they respond and we're, they were happy about our connection. But the homeless were more available than people walking in the streets. Mm -hmm. Like they were like everyone in their cell phones, uh, hooked with some, something else in their drama or the dilemma and so I took the risk to speak with the homeless mm -hmm. and it was a lot of fun. So thank you Rachel for bringing that joy and that excitement and I want to take the risk. This is Martha. Um, I'm not, this isn't really a reflection of the, of the conversation, but what has happened here for me is that in taking risk and seeing people, seeing the individuals open themselves up and take a risk and being seen and how each person has been received. And for me, this is like the perfect world that to be able to take a risk and be held and doing it and supported while doing it even if it even if you know like it's a flop but it I don't even know like it's when you when I take a risk and I feel supported no matter what the outcome it's different it doesn't feel like I failed it just feels like I did something brave mm -hmm. no matter what the outcome yeah To me, like what you were saying, Martha, like taking a risk, it feels like it's never a flop because just by doing it, it didn't flop. Like even if what you said, people don't exactly understand or get or agree with, it's just the, it's just the act of doing it, you know, mm -hmm. that, that makes it not be a flop, like makes it a success. You know, and I just want to go back to what Monica said too about, um, I think like Monica took that big risk before to bring up the, the earring story, you know, the <laughs> earring story and, and then Lynn named it the, the earring principle. <laughs> and it's just something about that to me that's like, I'm never going to look at a pair of earrings the same way again. And... <laughs> I just find that to be like, oh, that's the earring principle. And like, just like there's something in the, the giggle of it, the laughing of it. And what um, Yoke said too about Lynn's giving this time, the, the big risk of seven minutes to us. And just sometimes when there's humor in things, like I know humor can cover things up, but sometimes humor can be really like uniting. And I just want to say that that's here for me, too. Well, since Martha took a risk, I'll take a risk and speak. Um, I, um, what, what I'm getting is what really is involved in having a 
an open um, conversation, a live conversation. And um, Rachel with her, you know, throwing a softball instead of spiking it at somebody. And I, it's something for me, um, for me to learn that, you know, if I feel really strongly about something, I can get, um, I, I have to learn to listen and to be receptive also to the other person. And even if I don't agree and won't agree, and um, it was Kate who said, I think, I don't know how to respond right now, but I'm with you. I guess it's a gentleman quote. And um, that's, that's very helpful. Um, the other thing I find is, I realized is when you have a real personal connection with the subject under discussion, for instance, um, Isabel is talking about Haitians and I have a, a very close relationship with a, per, with a person who's in Haiti and was deported and um, we're working to get him back. And I, it's, it's, not, it's very hard to be, you know, be able to listen someone who says, oh, those people, you know, they shouldn't be here. You know, they don't belong here or whatever. Why did they come here? And they should come here legally and blah, 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 whatever. And, um, you know, how to sort of gain some perspective to be able to listen. It's just really hard when it's personal. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of personal, um, Monica, I just wanted to respond to you um, about your feeling uh, people in New York weren't really friendly to you. And as, as a New Yorker for many years, you know, that makes me feel sad that you didn't feel uh, welcomed or that you could speak to people in New York. Um, I think New Yorkers are some of the nicest people in the world. I think that they just, you know, sometimes there's so much stimulation going on around that it can seem that uh, they're not as available. I wish I could have met you on the bus. Um, and I'm also uh, really glad that all those homeless people had a kind, uh, lovely person who took the time to sit down and see them as equal human beings because they are. And to sit down and spend the time to talk with them, I wish more of us would do the same. So just wanted to, to thank you for that, for, for being a New Yorker in that way and reaching out to others. So come back, you really need to stay in New York for four months to really feel like you can talk to anybody. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I love, I know beautiful people in New York, beautiful. Well, Lynn is from New York, Rachel is from New York, my teacher is from New York, Charlotte. Well, she lives in New York, but anyway, um, I, well, I, I don't have to self explain myself and I didn't want it to be offensive to anyone. And that's part of what we were, talking in this spontaneity that sometimes we can say something that can be offensive for someone else. So because of your lovely response, I really want to explain myself, you know, I don't have to, to go to New York to be, to feel like I'm with sleeping people around me. Believe me, in my family, there's a lot of members that does that. <laughs> so it doesn't, Probably it's not about New York. It's about feeling isolated in a, in a world where everyone is cut off. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people is cut off with a with a television, this, that, that, business, rush, pressure, uh, kids. Uh, uh, so so yes, is a. Uh, kind of feeling isolated uh, when everyone, well, not, I don't want to say everyone. Some of the people are disconnected. 
and I'm trying to make a connection. So it's not about mm -hmm. New York, believe me, I have family members that I feel so isolated when I'm with them. Thank you, Clara, for making the, thank you so much. And for sure, I will come back. Lynn knows that I go very often. Mm -hmm. So next time I see you. Thank you, Monica, yeah. And thank you for explaining that. Um, that really, uh, I really get that, you know, how, um, you know, we don't have to be in a big city to feel uh, like disconnected from others when people are just not present, you know? And I, I do think in very big cities, it can be harder when you're feeling isolated to feel even more so, you know? So yeah, so thank you. Thank you, really. Uh, hello, everybody, it's BJ. I, uh, when we were first getting uh, ready to begin the class, someone, I think Miriam, said her daughter was getting married and she was not planning to go. And so there was a kind of an awkwardness for a moment and we went forward because there was a, a, a larger purpose for the entire group at the time. But And I'm only on my phone, I can't see anyone. But Miriam, if you're still here, I, I just want you to know that I heard that and if there's something you'd like to say further about it, it would be lovely to hear. BJ, I don't think Miriam left. Miriam left. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Then I'm done. But thank you for naming that, BJ. That's mm -hmm. that seemed like something um, that would that would have been nice to hear more about for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And it's been a little while um, since um, since Jonathan spoke, and I and uh, just I, I may not recall everything, but I I do want to um, reflect back about um, that kind of um, what 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 you were saying, Jonathan, about um, the our struggles and and the wrestling with, to use your 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 phrase about um, uh, around the, I don't know what to say. And uh, that, that varying people were, were speaking about. And, um, and then you also sp spoke about the, um, that kind of notion of the, con um, mm -hmm. the conversation and a certain mm -hmm. sense having a life that we're part of, but also it's bigger mm -hmm. than us and that kind of thing. And, and uh, um, yeah, and how we can find our, and the, and the struggles or the challenges of finding our way into that messy thing. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And um, I'm going to say it because there, you know, Monica, we were speaking about losing your father and a certain kind of rawness and vulnerability that may also have been part of your connecting with people. And um, I, um, I, I shared this story about um, an, old, uh, an old friend of mine who was, um, I walked in to visit him in the hospital. He was suffering, it was about 17 years ago now, and he had cancer and, and I'd walked into the um, to the, uh, the, the, his room and just after the doctors were leaving and telling him that, um, uh, that the treatment that they were giving was not gonna work. And so it was just after that. And I said to my friend, his name was Obi, I said uh, to him, I don't know what to say. And I'm gonna share what I often share on his behalf is he said, that's okay, Steve. In matters like this, we're all fools. <laughs> and so I think there's something very powerful about that. Mm. Uh, we're all fools. So, but um, can still show up. So that was alive for me in an existential kind of way. Well, since the seven minutes are up, I think maybe nine. 
<laughs> I want to say I, I love that as a way of closing our workshop that in matters like this, living conversation, we're all fools and we're all so wise. I want to thank you for um, uh, catching me as I was, um, as I was leaping uh, in my risk of not being the coordinator here and uh, just appreciating everybody's dancing together and holding the dance and catching each other and catching the ball and all of these metaphors that we've been mixing. This has been really a wonderful experience to me and I loved the best of it. I loved when I took my risk of not being the coordinator and just being part of the conversation. So it, we have only about two minutes so anything that anybody wants to say as a closing, um, a closing uh, words, uh, this is this is the time. I'd like to say thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. Thank you. For me, it seems that uh, you know this personal. Uh, experiences of Monica and Ms. Steve and uh, um, I forgot her name, but um, you know, got got personal that that it kind of felt like it brought us together. Mm. Uh, you know that you know this bringing us together. Yes, it was, thank you. Uh, it, was, it was great. That's one some wonder a wonderful principle to sort of take with us also beside the earring principle that. Uh, the personal brings us together. I just wanted to thank everybody for being part of these conversations that felt like, kind of like I was telling my group, like a, like when you focus where it feels like, this feels like there's really something here that's really important to me. And it's not, not quite in focus yet, but it, it feels very meaningful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I want to mirror that, that feel that way too. Something really important that isn't in focus yet, but maybe can't be quite in focus. And I want to thank all of you and hope to see you all soon in one way or another. And thank you so much. <laughs>